Hi everyone, I'm Shachar Kvatinsky. Uh, we, we are about to start. Uh, we have more than 100 people, so we can start. It's a nice number. Um, I'm very happy uh, that we have uh, Professor Elad Elon from UC Berkeley for this uh, webinar. It's part of the ACRC webinar series. We started this series uh, after the corona issues started and we understood that we can't have on-campus seminars. As well as valid validation in an agile way. So just to be clear, when I say verification here, what I mean is, you know, you had a specification and you're going to check, did you actually build the thing that you wrote in your specification or that you intended to build for the specification? Uh, and by validation, what I mean is, you know, are you actually meeting the end requirements of the application slash customer? Uh, and those two are subtly different because, you know, one could build a fully verified, you know, absolutely quote unquote correct design that may not actually meet the end needs of the customer. Um, and this is another reason why, you know, sort of having these full cycles all the way through is very important because uh, that's the best way to really get feedback back from the application or customer about, okay, yeah, this is indeed what I really wanted or this indeed really does what I do, what I wanted or not. So from a hardware standpoint, uh, I'm going to argue that the key missing piece in all of this um, is really just the dearth of reuse. Um, now, to be clear, and, you know, I, I sort of have this hat now on the, on the commercial side as well. You know, this is not to say that there is not IP out there. There, there absolutely is a, a large amount of IP. Uh, in fact, you know, I think the analog mixed signal IP market uh, is actually, you know, very large and, and continuously growing. Uh, so, you know, there's definitely a healthy ecosystem there. But I think the problem that, that really very much exists and that I think, you know, is one of the key barriers here is that, you know, when you go and you buy that IP, it's largely black box. Um, and so that means that, you know, if there happens to be an IP that's kind of very close to what it is that you want to do, but not quite correct, you know, you're sort of stuck in this situation where you either have to go and decide to develop the thing for yourself or go and essentially pay the vendor to, to essentially kind of come back and modify their stuff to meet your specific requirements. So said, you know, more explicitly, it really is pretty hard to extend, modify, and in some cases even verify that black box IP. And, you know, this is really important kind of in this global context that I set in the beginning, because as we said before, you know, oftentimes you're building this custom silicon because there's some fairly specific application you want to, you know, you want to work in. Um, and sure, maybe a, a large chunk of the stuff you're doing is fairly standardized, but, you know, at the end of the day, you're building a custom chip because there is some special sauce that you want to include. Uh, and oftentimes that special sauce will end up touching lots of little pieces of the subsystem that, you know, otherwise, you know, might have been IP, but now you need to make a change to them. And so that's where sort of this issue really becomes uh, very, uh, very difficult. So the overall approach that, uh, you know, we've really been, been following at UC Berkeley um, is to essentially, you know, kind of follow the, the strategy of saying, look, we really should not be just developing individual chips and individual, what I'm going to call instances. Instead, what we should really be doing is capturing our designer's methodologies in the form of an executable generator. So the idea of this executable generator is, you know, rather than the designer saying, okay, yeah, you know, I made this decision this way, you know, I, made, I decided to resolve this trade-off in this way and so on and so forth, is you're trying to get the designer to just write as a piece of executable code the approach that they took to come up with all these design decisions. Uh, and then instead of, again, actually delivering sort of the end of individual chip, the designer delivers that code, and then the code is executed to actually give you back the particular chip or instance that you're interested in. So the reason why we believe this is a very powerful approach is that this is really facilitating reuse in a, in a strong way through kind of two sort of two key, two key uh, aspects. The first is that, you know, if you've done it, if you have a reasonably good methodology and you've written the code in a reasonably good way, you know, this should really be parameterized, right? You know, you can kind of think about it, hey, like, I should be able to sort of reasonably gracefully figure out how do things scale as I change, you know, let's say, the example, the number of processor cores, the number of IOs, or, you know, the, the number of bits I want in a data converter, or so on and so forth, right? These are all things that should be essentially just parameters that are input to your generator, and therefore, if you actually really need to make a change, either because you need a different application or you just have, you know, sort of a totally different instance in mind, you know, that should be a fairly straightforward thing to do, right? You just run the code rather than going back and, you know, bugging the human expert. Similarly, if we go back to this case that I was pointing at previously where, you know, there was a thing that kind of did close to what I wanted, but not quite, not quite. Well, you know, you can actually then go back into the generator code and incrementally extend it, right? You can say, okay, yeah, for this part of the things, I really want to do it this way and not that way. Uh, you don't necessarily have to worry about all of the rest of it because you know that the rest of that is indeed capturing your current best known methodology. And again, when I say incremental extension, I'm talking about, you know, incrementing or uh, uh, adjusting the generator itself, not the instance. 
So kind of, you know, ho hopefully this all sounds, you know, reasonably interesting and, and perhaps even compelling, but you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're engineers, we want real data. And so, you know, we've definitely been asking ourselves, well, all right, you know, how do we really do this and how well does it really work? Uh, so answering this question has really been the goal of, you know, my collaborators, my colleagues, my students, and myself over, I'd say, the last few years under a number of different programs. Uh, in particular, I'll mention more about this in a moment. The DARPA Craft program has you know, funded and driven a lot of this work, uh, as you can imagine, uh, in, in sort of, you know, government applications. They sort of are the epitome of things that have fairly low volume, but very, very high design complexity. And so, you know, this is a very strong problem there. Uh, but this is actually very true in the commercial world as well. So just to give a little bit of credit where credit is due, um, in the Starper Craft program in particular, uh, there's a large team of folks that was all contributing to various aspects of this. Uh, so I myself was the PI, uh, my colleague at Berkeley, Bora Nikolic, was the co-PI, along with Jonathan Backrack and Koshik Sen, uh, who were leading a lot of the digital and verification work. Uh, we had the pleasure of working closely with a number of partners. Uh, so for example, Richard Berger and, and a large team from VAA Systems, uh, as well as Stephen Schock and Matthew Dorfling from Northrop Grumman. Uh, and then finally, all this was, you know, done again in close collaboration with Cadence, uh, particularly Mike, Cell Fox, and Joseph Cole. Uh, and again, you know, there's a long list of many, many more names uh, from all these organizations. Uh, here, I'm just sort of showing you some of the, the key uh, principal investigators. So what I'm going to do in the rest of the talk is, you know, first, just tell you a little bit more about some of the particular platforms we built to enable this generator type of design. Um, and then at the end, I'll, I'll basically tell you some more about, you know, some of the uh, chips and sort of uh, demonstrators we have done using this approach and, you know, give you a little bit of prognostication for moving forward at the very end. So just starting out with sort of what are some of the platforms that we built in the generator side of things. Uh, let's start out with, with, you know, essentially the digital and particularly essentially the RTL type of generators. Uh, so the, the first platform that, you know, we, we sort of developed at this uh, in UC Berkeley, this is really led by my colleague Jonathan Backrack. Uh, is, is a platform that we call CHISL. So CHISL stands for Constructing Hardware in Scala Embedded Language. Um, and it really is a hardware construction language. So I'm gonna say a bunch of things that if you're not a software person may not make 100% sense. Uh, don't worry, I will flip back to, you know, sort of a more boots on the ground hardware perspective in a moment. Uh, but basically what CHISL is, is it's a software library whose classes represent the hardware primitives. And the methods basically connect those classes together. So in other words, when you execute the software, what you're doing is you're just constructing a graph that represents the RTL. So as I said, you know, for, for some fraction of you, that probably doesn't make any sense what I just said. So let me just, you know, sort of be very concrete. So the goal with Chisel is not actually to change the hardware abstraction level at all. Okay, so there's no fancy compiler. This is not high level synthesis. There's not, you know, sort of, you know, a very fancy algorithm under the hood trying to figure out what it is you intended. Uh, instead, this is really just intended to be make it easier for you as a designer to capture what your own approach was to actually build various types of, of digital hardware in this case. So the thing that's really being improved from an abstraction standpoint is the software which captures your methodology. Okay, so there's all these features specifically of Scala of things like, you know, powerful parameterization, functional and object oriented programming, uh, static typing, which, you know, again, if you talk to these folks uh, is sort of one of the key benefits they really were looking for. Um, and perhaps even most importantly, there's just a huge base of existing software libraries. Uh, you know, so there's a whole bunch of things out there that, you know, if you want to go and check, hey, did I do this algorithm for my own design correctly? You know, you can just go and grab some of these libraries and, and reuse them rather than, you know, sort of doing everything from scratch. So again, the key point here is that, you know, it's not that we're trying to sort of abstract what your hardware is. We're instead trying to capture what the knowledge of the designer is in constructing that hardware in the first place. So Chisel actually, as I, as I said, has been around for, it's, I guess it's around nine years or so now. And there's been a whole number of chips that have been developed and designed in Chisel. Uh, in fact, I know of even some industry chips that are out there that, you know, have components of them that were done in Chisel. Uh, although obviously I don't necessarily have uh, their particular die photos to share here. Uh, most of these were done at UC Berkeley. Some of these in collaboration uh, with, with folks who, uh, at least at the time, were at MIT. Uh, but you can see there's a pretty sort of decent progression of things that have been built up over time in a wide variety of process technologies. Uh, so I'm going to say a little bit more about some of these things that are over on the side relative to that, to that DARPA craft program. Uh, you know, but these are in, you know, real, you know, real state-of-the-art, or I should say, you know, near state-of-the-art types of process technologies. Uh, so for example, 16 nanometer from TSMC, you know, it's a real FinTech process. And you'll see there's a good, you know, tens of millions of, of gates kind of on these chips, uh, which for academic designs is, you know, quite a large uh, endeavor. So there's another very kind of closely related aspect to all this, uh, which, I, which I really want to highlight, um, which again, you know, all of this stuff was being driven by reuse, right? And so if you think about some of your RTL, 
uh, there's a chunk of it which is is really being sort of very specifically driven by what implementation platform you're actually targeting it towards, right? So as an example, and this is a sort of a simple one, you know, let's say that I want to take some particular piece of RTL and target it to, you know, an FPGA or emulation platform versus some particular process technology or some other different process technology. Uh, so you can imagine there's there's pieces of this that may be quite different depending upon what that implementation platform really would be. Uh, the simplest example of this that I always like to point to is just, you know, well, hey, at the end of the day, I want probably some SRAMs. And so I have to, you know, sort of go and actually point to specific SRAM macros in any given process technology. But the issue that you then quickly face is that, you know, if I want my, my sort of whole generator to be reusable, I don't want it to be intimately linked to that specific SRAM macro because, you know, I should be able to just say, hey, look, there's a memory thing that I want, and then later actually have it mapped to the particular process technology. So there's another aspect to this, which is really just what I'm going to call separation of concerns between kind of the core RTL itself and the platform-specific things that you want to do uh, to either, you know, sort of just build the thing at all or perhaps to do sort of further optimizations. And so by separating those two things out, we can really maximize the reuse. So there's another sort of piece in this overall, let's say, platform stack, which is what I'm going to call fertile. So fertile stands for flexible intermediate representation uh, for RTL. Uh, for those of you who, again, are, are sort of more in the software side of things, um, you can kind of think of this as LLVM for hardware. Uh, LLVM is basically sort of, you know, a, a, a very popular open source uh, approach for, for compilers. Um, and the idea is essentially that you just want to introduce an additional abstraction layer in between sort of the uh, implementation independent RTL parts, which again, you want to keep that, you know, sort of independent so you can maximize reuse versus any particular optimizations that you want to do either on a sort of particular, you know, subtype of things that may be reusable across multiple blocks or based on sort of optimizations you want to do for a particular implementation platform. So the idea is that, you know, you essentially start out with your, your chisel generator that you've written in Scala. Um, you know, you have essentially a front-end parser that, that takes that Scala and translates it into an intermediate representation, or the IR. And then essentially you have a bunch of reusable transformations that then just go and look at that intermediate representation and essentially do optimizations for either project or platform specific things that you want to do. And so the idea here is that you're not going back and altering the original RTL, you're just going and sort of doing swaps on this intermediate representation. Uh, and you're doing this in a way where all of these transformations are composable. So again, to sort of pull back on that, on that SRAM example, you know, now I really can write a generator that just says, hey, you know, give me a bank of memory that's, you know, X, Y, Z in, in, you know, in size. And then, you know, that'll go and produce an intermediate representation that doesn't care what the platform is. And then when you go and say, okay, I'm actually building this now on, you know, let's say Global Foundry's 45 SOI, it can go and grab the real SRAM libraries, figure out how to mold them into this particular size you wanted and so on and so forth. So basically by the time you're done, it's really the back end that emits the actual final design or instance. So, you know, now that we've kind of talked about the digital side, um, and, and in all honesty, you know, I think the digital side is a little bit easier to see from an adoption standpoint, simply because, you know, digital folks tend to be more amenable to, you know, sort of coding and, and automation, you know, overall. Uh, so the next question, of course, is, well, you know, how about the analog mix signal side? Um, and I've kind of jokingly poked fun at, you know, sort of analog mix signal folks. To be clear, I count myself in this bucket, so please don't be offended. You know, I'm, I'm teasing myself just as much as I'm teasing anyone else. Um, but, you know, uh, overall, analog designers have really been very, very resistant to automation overall. Now, there are very good reasons for this that I'll touch on a little bit more, uh, you know, probably down as we go further in the talk. But, you know, historically, uh, this is definitely, you know, analog automation is definitely one of those things where, you know, you go and you talk to some academics and they say, yeah, you know, there's a lot of dead bodies in that closet. So... Because of the fact that automation really has been very difficult to, to move forward, and again, to be clear, it's not that the tools haven't gotten better, it's just, you know, really sort of changing the core of the design loop, you know, I'd say from a 30,000 foot point of view really has not changed. Um, you know, overall, like, you know, kind of that core design loop really does look the same for probably around the last 30 years or so. Um, and if you sort of boil it down to perhaps it's, you know, most simplified, but you know, oftentimes, you know, really representative form, you know, you, as an analog designer, typically what you're doing is you're going, you know, you're drawing uh, some schematics, typically in Kids Virtuoso. You go and you verify some specifications, you know, using some simulator. Um, you know, then typically, you know, you, you get to a point where you're somewhat happy with it. Uh, oftentimes, you then hand that over to a wall, over the wall to a layout or mask designer. Uh, they will go and draw some layout um, and then sort of starts your iterative loop of, well, okay, hey, like, you know, 
something that came back from the layout may or may not be quite what I want. So I have to run some more simulations. I may have to resize things and then kind of repeat this thing until I eventually converge. So, you know, on the one hand, you'd argue that this is, you know, still quote unquote kind of primitive, but to be fair, you know, this is the process that works, right? This is the way that we've converged to, to make it so that, you know, we really can build these large sophisticated analog mixed signal things and, and really guarantee that they, you know, function in the real world. Now, to be clear, you know, particularly in these more modern process technologies, uh, you know, if I was to kind of redraw this picture in a more, let's say, representative way where size kind of represents time investment, um, it's become very clear that layout is, is really a, a substantial and perhaps even dominant bottleneck. Um, so, you know, the amount of time that's really spent essentially on kind of the, the sizing schematics and, you know, rerunning simulations of things compared to the sort of the, just the, the iteration time through the layout itself uh, tends to be relatively minimal. Um, and there are very good reasons for this, uh, as many of you, I'm sure, are aware. Uh, you know, the, the rules that one has to deal with in these very advanced process technologies uh, with both, you know, FinFETs as well as the multi-patterning issues, uh, you know, they can really get very, very complicated and cause it, you know, really sort of very unintuitive things to happen, particularly when you put blocks together uh, and you sort of didn't take into account appropriate effects from the multi-patterning in particular. So, you know, I, I kind of set up some time saying, hey, why is it, you know, analog designers have been, you know, really resistant to automation. Uh, and, you know, so the core design loop really hasn't changed. So you, the next natural question is, well, okay, so what are you going to do? Um, and the answer is, you know, I'm actually not going to try and change that design loop. Um, instead, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to try to capture that design loop in the form of this executable generator code, right? So the key difference here is that I'm not telling analog designers, hey, you need to do things in a different way than you did before in terms of, you know, what actual operations you're doing. You just need to figure out how it is, you know, what it was you really were doing when you came up with the design and then translate that into a piece of executable code so that now it can actually be reused uh, and parameterized and incrementally extended as we discussed in the very beginning. So again, the key here is that we're reusing the design loop itself, not the results of that design loop. So the particular framework that, you know, we, we've developed to, to enable this is what we call the Berkeley Analog Generator, or BAG for short. Um, there's actually a new version of this that we sort of cleverly renamed to now be recursive, uh, which is, you know, BAG is now just the BAG Analog Signal Generator, uh, for reasons that I'll sort of mention a little bit more later on. Um, and basically all BAG is, is essentially it's a Python-based framework. Uh, again, all of this is completely open source that is just allowing you to specify, you know, as an analog designer, what is it I actually did to come up with a set of schematics, layout, uh, you know, sort of simulations, and so on and so forth. So to a zero-order approximation, you, know, you can kind of think of BAG as just being something that takes care of all of the quote-unquote plumbing needed for you to write a piece of Python code that will replicate what you yourself do by hand. So for example, if you want to say, hey, if this transistor should be sized, you know, with this number of fingers and with this width, you know, BAG gives you essentially all the methods you need to be able to do that and then actually have things show up in your virtuoso instance afterwards. And, you know, I've just given this one fairly simplified example, but, you know, the general principle applies kind of across the entire uh, CAD tool flow, particularly, you know, with at least this schematic layout loop that we've been talking about a moment ago. So just to give you a little bit more detail here, uh, you know, if we sort of, you know, dive into what would like a full circuit generator look like? And to be clear, when I say a full circuit generator, you know, the ideal goal here would be something like, hey, give me a set of input for performance specifications, as well as, you know, a particular process technology, and then just have the code go through and actually generate everything it is that you would need to actually have an end design, uh, you know, really working. So the way we typically partition these things, um, you know, you can mostly focus kind of up on the top over here, at least at the moment, um, you know, the way we partition that is we typically say, all right, well, there's going to be this so-called design script where this design script is going to take in those high-level performance specifications. And it's the design script job to figure out how is it that I'm actually going to do all of this, the detailed sizing decisions to meet these performance specifications. Then underneath those is going to be the layout and schematic generators. Um, so all the layout and schematic generators are supposed to do is they're supposed to take, you know, relatively low-level detailed parameters, things like transistor widths, lengths, uh, you know, number of fingers, how many wiring tracks you need, things of this nature. And then just actually produce DRC LVS correct schematics and layouts, you know, that represent those particular sets of parameters. Now, obviously closely associated with this, and, you know, again, I'll touch on this more a little bit later. Um, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of times it's actually spent verifying what you did. Um, and so there's an entire verification framework that's also built into BAG. Uh, this is really where you're sort of building in all of these sort of simulations and, you know, sort of things that you do to try and check any particular instance you built. Um, and as you can imagine, you know, this is also where there's going to be a lot of looping involved because your design script is going to go and run a bunch of simulations. 
uh, and actually typically on the real post layout, uh, you know, sort of design and then tell you, okay, hey, yeah, like I should probably resize this thing this way or I actually couldn't meet this specification or so on and so forth. Yeah, so just to be clear, it's this design script that's, that's trying to capture sort of, you know, what algorithm is it that the designer used to take these performance specifications and translate them into the lower level structural parameters used by the layout and schematic generators. Now, I'm going to say a lot more about the, the layout in a moment, uh, but also, you know, what this design script is and everything like that would work, uh, you know, tends to be one of the sort of biggest early questions in this. So I just want to sort of, you know, go through one very, very simple, actually two very simple examples of what a design script might look like. Uh, to just, you know, give people a little bit more concrete a feeling for, for what this really means. So from a generic standpoint, and again, I'll make this more specific in a moment, um, let's say you, you know, just you, you have some set of input parameters you want, say like amplifier gain, bandwidth, you know, offset, and so on and so forth. Well, what I could initially do is just go and analytically or otherwise compute some of my lower level parameters, you know, for sizing and things like that from those specifications. I can go and just generate and then extract the layout of that particular circuit. I can then perform some measurements on that and then just check, okay, hey, did I meet my original specifications or not? If I did, great, I basically am done and I can just save that instance. And if I didn't, you know, one of the simplest thing you can imagine doing, which, you know, we don't really typically do this exactly by hand, but we kind of do something close. We can say, okay, well, you know, I thought the map between bandwidth and current was, you know, let's say linear with some proportionality factor. But, you know, if my bandwidth was off by a factor of two, let me just go back and pretend that everything should have been rescaled by two recompute you know what parameter i actually need and then just go back through the loop of generating and extracting the circuit and rechecking my measurement now to be clear this particular algorithm you know if you ask any sort of optimization person you know this is by no means guaranteed to succeed um, but you know and this is again intended to be a fairly simple example here but actually this style of approach you know can actually be applied fairly broadly and i would argue mimics pretty closely a lot of times what we as humans just do by hand when we're sort of trying to tweak things and, and get into a reasonable table so just to make this sort of a little bit more concrete, um, let's imagine that what you wanted to do was you know, size a, a particular resistor uh, and your, your main constraint was electromigration, which turns out actually is probably the dominant constraint for many of the designs that you know, people are doing these days. So you, know, you could be essentially given, hey, there's a particular target resistance I want and a particular bias current I want to flow through that thing. So let me just go and assume what the maximum width of this you know, particular resistor could be. And then just compute how many of those resistors I need to put in parallel to actually satisfy the electromigration cons uh, constraint given this bias current. Okay, so obviously this is going to end up being, you know, sort of a, a non-integer number. Um, and so once I've chosen an appropriate integer, then I might actually have some additional capability relative to what I really need. So then I can go back and just reduce the width a little bit to just barely hit that electromigration constraint. Okay. Then I'm essentially almost done. Uh, I would just sort of compute, well, what is the length I need to actually meet the target resistance? Um, and you'd think you're done. It's just that, you know, sometimes, you know, a particular process technology, uh, you know, that length might exceed the maximum length you're allowed to. And if that's the case, then you just break the thing into a series combinations of things, and then you're finally done. So just to give you another sort of more concrete example, um, you know, let's say what you want to do was, was build a design script for like a simple differential amplifier. Um, and in particular, all you cared about was the gain, the bandwidth, and the load capacitance. So you could just go and, you know, so let's say pick your transistor links and thresholds and ratios, you know, all the biases and everything. You can just kind of go in and pick that somewhat arbitrarily. Uh, look up all the small signal parameters from a table. And then just check, hey, is it even possible to meet the specifications, right? You can either do this analytically or, or through simulation. Uh, if it is, then great, we can kind of proceed. And if it's not, then you just go back and pick something else. If it is possible, it um, turns out it's actually really easy for this particular case to compute how much bias current uh, you know, you'd actually spend. And I've written the equation in that box there. If you're not familiar with it, I can point you to like, you know, three different videos or whatever where, where I kind of drive this in class. It just happens to be one of my you know, sort of favorite simple equations because it's really handy, uh, but I won't spend too much time on that here. Uh, so once you've computed how much bias current you actually need, you can then say, all right, well, let me compare that against all the designs I've done, in particular, the best designs I've gotten so far. If I happen to be doing better now, I'll keep this one. If not, I'll keep the previous best. And then I'll just check, hey, are there any options left? And if there are, I'll kind of loop back through. And if not, I'll just you know, kind of come back and return the optimal instance. So again, this is really just sort of mimicking what I'd argue we sometimes do you know, by hand as humans. We just say, okay, hey, like, you know, there's these set of specs I want. You know, let me go and kind of you know, pick, hey, I usually know that a low VT device is good. And I know that you know, sort of like either a minimum or 2X or 3X or whatever it is, channel length is good. You know, and then you go and you sort of, you know, check it out and see if it's really good and then maybe make a couple of comparisons 
this whole sort of uh, design script that I'm describing here is very much mimicking that hand approach. So now that we've you know, kind of gotten through and hopefully I've given you a little bit more context on you know, what kind of approaches it is that we have in mind for capturing here, um, you know, as I said before, where we tend to spend a lot of our time is actually in the layout. Uh, and so what I spend kind of the rest of the you know, sort of bag focus part on is, is just you know, how do we handle layout stuff? And what's hopefully clear here is that it's pretty hard to sort of directly use just a bunch of polygon drawing commands, right? Like if all you can do is say, put a rectangle here, put a rectangle there and so on and so forth, it's pretty hard to see how you could really reuse that either to get sort of more, you know, more param parametric behavior in a given process technology or equally importantly, being able to move from one process technology to the next. So I would say that really kind of the number one realization that I think has allowed us to have some degree of success here is, is that simply you don't really care about the polygons. What you really care about is what I'm going to call the floor plan strategy. Okay. And I'll show you sort of more of an example of this in a moment. But conceptually, what this is really talking about is if I have a given layout that I want to do, I usually have in my mind a strategy for how I'm going to build that floor plan up as a function of parameters like how much current do I have, how much transistor width do I have, how many signals do I need to deal with, and so on and so forth. Okay, so again, you know, the, the realizations are just that first, you know, we really want to capture, uh, focus on capturing that floor plan strategy or the floor plan concept uh, and the constraints associated with that rather than any process specific geometry details. And then the second, which is, you know, perhaps obvious, but, but really, you know, simplifies things a lot, is just they're going to enforce a routing and hence device grid, uh, you know, where, where certain milliliters go only in certain directions and have, you know, sort of quantized widths and sort of parameters associated with them really just to dramatically simplify many of the DRC issues that you see, particularly in these very advanced process technologies. So kind of the crux of the argument that I was making in the previous slide is that, you know, I'm sort of saying that, hey, I think I can describe a concept of a layout floor plan that really should not depend that much on the process technology. The, obviously, the, the exact dimensions will depend on the process technology, but, you know, the approach that I take to put the floor plan together, that's the thing that I'm arguing should not be changing. So what I'm showing you here is just three layouts. Um, it's basically, quote unquote, the same differential amplifier, just in three very different process technologies. Uh, so one is a FinFET, one is a bulk CMOS, and one is a partially depleted SOI. Um, and you need to squint a little bit, uh, but if you kind of look carefully enough, you'll see that the general structure is actually very similar across all three of these. And the reason for that is very simple. So it turns out in many analog circuits, you know, as I said a moment ago, you're very strongly driven by electromigration. So what that tends to do is it basically says that, all right, I should essentially build up my transistors essentially as rows of devices where each individual finger I size so that it can carry the, you know, the desired or the appropriate amount of current that's allowed given the electromigration of the metal that connects to it. And now if I need to scale things up, meaning I need to draw more current because I need more GM, more bandwidth, and so on and so forth, I essentially just expand the number of fingers that I use horizontally within that row. So the type of floor plan this tends to end you up with is that, you know, kind of within a block, meaning within a, a circuit that, you know, that is sort of sharing current vertically, so to speak. Um, indeed, you have these rows of transistors with essentially these vertical wires in between them. And as long as you size each individual finger to make sure it meets the electromigration constraints, you can just expand horizontally and you will not actually violate electromigration as you add additional current in. So you can see everything I described really is quite process independent. Right, you know, which wires you need, how you draw the transistors, and so on and so forth, those are all process dependent. But you know, the general structure really is quite uh, agnostic to the process technology. Uh, and then just to you know, sort of finish the thought, uh, you know, so essentially what this is saying is within a block, all my routing is vertical, and then essentially to connect from one block to the next, where you typically don't have DC current flowing through, that's where you have these horizontal wires, uh, that you know, that, you know, and that's the one that you know, you'd actually have to sort of choose a width to deal with electromigration. But because it's typically more AC currents, that tends to be a much easier thing to do. So these are those same three uh, differential amplifiers that I was mentioning a moment ago. This is to sort of prove that, yes, this whole thing end-to-end -end really can work in practice. This is a very, very simple example. I admit that. Uh, but you know, it's just sort of simple enough that it's easy to show people and, and be sort of convincing. Uh, so here in this particular case, again, this is just a simple differential amplifier where the input specs are the gain and the bandwidth. Um, and an important thing to note here is that the same singular piece of code for both the layout and the schematics actually, and as well as actually even the design script, produced all three of these instances and all three of them were DRC LVS clean out of the bat. The only difference from a code standpoint was just that underneath the hood, we plugged in different process specific primitives, 
So these process specific primitives, they're the ones that know, okay, yeah, like when I draw a row of, you know, of whatever, 10 fingers with, you know, a width of X, they're the ones that really know how to draw those transistors correctly and make sure that there's actually interconnect available to, you know, actually get connected to them and hook everything up the appropriate way. And so what you can see over here on the right side of the, the slide is just that, you know, indeed, the gain is essentially matching perfectly across all three instances, because again, we just designed it to be that way. Uh, the phase is also very, very similar, at least out to very, very high frequencies, uh, where, you know, most likely this is just due to some of the secondary effects from the particular process technology. And then just again, numerically, everything is within, a, you know, around 10% or so of each other. And to be honest, this 10% was just because that's roughly what we set the, uh, you know, sort of the, uh, uh, the tolerance margin in the optimization loop to be. You know, you can tighten that up and you get even closer than this. So hopefully by this point you're saying, okay, well, this, this all sounds pretty interesting, but hey, you know, you've just shown me some like, you know, really silly differential amplifier. Uh, and my response is yes, indeed. You know, if, if all we could do is differential amplifiers, then this is not, you know, particularly compelling. Uh, but the good news is we've really done, you know, quite a bit more sophisticated things than, than just that. Um, and this is really sort of a very small subsampling of things we've done, uh, you know, so far. Uh, I'm happy to give folks a longer list if there's interest. Uh, but, you know, the other sort of point that I, I touched on but didn't explicitly sort of highlight is that all of this you do in a hierarchical fashion, right? So an example, you might start out by writing generators for lower level simpler pieces. So things like a comparator, a switch capacitor DAC, maybe a resistor ladder DAC for biasing. You know, once you've got those three, you can, you know, put those together with a couple of other elements and actually go and build sort of a unit SAR ADC. Once you've got a unit SAR ADC, then you can say, well, actually, I really want, you know, higher performance. So I can go and build a generator of time interleaved SAR ADCs. Uh, and when I say this, you know, this is not literally just, you know, slapping like N of these SAR ADCs together. There's all the appropriate, you know, sort of biasing and references and sort of uh, time interleaving uh, mechanisms of, you know, generating the clock appropriately with low jitter and so on and so forth. Um, and I'd say that, you know, probably one of the, the highest level of sophistications that we've done so far is we've actually built up generators, at least on the layout and schematic side, as well as all the simulations, for full SERDES transmitters and receivers up in the, you know, multi-tens of gigabit per second kind of rates. Um, so, yes, yeah, so you, you really can build, you know, quite sophisticated things and, in fact, even, you know, sort of get very good performance out of them. Uh, and I'll say some more about that perhaps a little bit later, uh, you know, if there's any questions on it. So just to be clear, you know, I showed you kind of like individual layout pictures on this previous slide. These really are all generators, uh, you know, so that means they are portable and, and parameterized. Uh, so for example, if you look on the left, you know, the, the core of that time interleaved SAR ADC, I'm just showing you pictures here in three different process technologies where, again, the same piece of code was used to generate the instances in all three of these. Uh, so the original design was actually sort of targeted for TSMC-16. But again, same code with just different primitives was able to prove things in, you know, Global Foundry's 22 nanometers fully depleted SOI, as well as ST20 nanometer fully depleted SOI. Uh, and in fact, there's been things done on, you know, Intel 22 and you know, a number of other process technologies as well using the same ADC generator. Similarly, if you look over on the right and the SERDES receiver, uh, if you just sort of take the core of that data path, uh, simply because this is sort of a, an easier example to see, um, you know, we, we did this both in, for example, TSMC's 16 nanometer FinFET process, and again, same piece of code, just different primitives, was able to produce things in Global Foundry's 45, you know, RFPD SOI. Um, so that particular example, I think, is, is really interesting because, you know, obviously FinFET and partially depleted SOI are very, very different process technologies, have very, very different considerations. But again, you know, same piece of code was actually able to generate DRC-LBS correct layouts in both. Uh, so this is really showing the portability from a parameterization standpoint. Uh, if we look sort of deep inside that, that SERDES receiver, uh, there's a decision feedback equalizer, DFE for short. Uh, and here this is just showing, hey, I can just, you know, change a parameter and, and produce a very different number of, of taps in that decision feedback equalizer. Uh, you know, again, you may think, oh, well, this is really easy. I'm just adding more unit cells and things. Well, remember, there's a very tight timing constraint there. Uh, so you really have to sort of size things appropriately to be able to meet that timing constraint as you add additional taps in, where obviously you're adding additional parasitic capacitance. And sort of under the hood, all of those things are indeed automatically happening uh, when we really produce these two different designs here. So now that I've kind of gotten through the, the analog side of things, I do want to do justice to, to at least, you know, the verification. And I, honestly, this isn't even really full justice, but at least, you know, sort of giving it a little bit of a, a sort of flavor of things. Um, and, and if you sort of pay close attention to that chart I showed, you know, way back in the beginning, um, and I think this, I'm sure this jives with everyone's experiences as well, uh, you know, oftentimes the verification part, you know, takes just as much, if not even actually substantially more, as really doing the design in the first place. And so if in all of this effort, we just kind of capture the design, but don't really capture the verification, then, you know, in many ways, we really have not succeeded. So 
the answer is perhaps not going to be too surprising given the overall, you know, sort of uh, gist of the talk, which is just like we have generators that are capturing our best known methodologies for how we do the design in the first place, we need to build generators for how we do the verification as well. Okay, so we need some kind of generator that can go and produce essentially the full environment as long as along with all the tests, you know, in you know, essentially in close coordination with what are the design generators doing too. So when I say a verification generator, and here I'm kind of mostly implicitly talking about the digital side of things, but to be honest, much of this maps to analog as well. There's really two pieces to this. Um, so one is just, you know, as I'm changing the parameters of my particular design, making sure that I go and I produce and I check all the correct, you know, stimulus vectors. Um, and for this, you know, the particular way that, that we were doing this uh, was, you know, we wrote, for example, like a Python vector generator that knows details about, you know, this particular SOC or this particular signal processing that we're trying to do, and then goes and actually just, you know, produces all the vectors based on the input parameters to the original design generator. Um, and in this case, it's fed with some IP exact metadata. And then the other piece is really just hooking everything up correctly. So this is one of those things where you sort of, you know, you hide a little bit in, in embarrassment because um, it turns out that, you know, at least in the hardware world, um, particularly when you do this manually and particularly for sort of these large complex SOCs, uh, number two tends to be sort of the, the, the by far dominant source of errors and debug time. Because uh, as an example, you know, it's very easy for somebody to, you know, go and say, oh, hey, I've got like this clock underscore B and then connect it to B underscore clock by accident. And, you know, if you've got this, you know, multi-million or even tens of million gates SOC, you know, go figure out what you really did because, you know, now you can only observe, you know, sort of from a very high level that something totally crazy is happening. And so it just takes you a lot of digging to, you know, kind of go all the way through and figure out what actually happened. Now, to be clear, the particular example I'm giving is maybe a little bit silly, but this style and category of error, unfortunately, really is very easy to make and is really very common. Um, and in fact, our collaborators at Cadence you know, really went back and collected some data that, that showed that indeed, this is where about, if I remember correctly, anywhere from 60 to 80% of the verification time was being spent. So, you know, uh, given the fact that they had gone and done the study and realized that this was a significant problem, of course, they came up with a solution for it as well. Uh, this is what they call the verification workbench. And the idea here is that, you know, particularly for things where you've got a relatively well-known type of standard that you're trying to fit yourself into, then as long as you produce an IP exact representation that is sort of telling, telling the tools what is the mapping between the conceptual sort of standard-based thing you're doing and the real individual pins of this particular block, it essentially goes and does all of that hookup for you essentially automatically, as well as then goes and exercises all of the best-known verification techniques typically captured in the VIPs again, sort of automatically on any one of these instances that you've got available to you. Um, so this is, again, very powerful because now it's allowing you to build these essentially verification environments that will be automatically scaling and moving along with the actual, uh, you know, sort of design generator that you built in the first place. So, okay, so I've told you a lot about, you know, the various platforms, uh, you know, at, at this point, you know, this is hopefully the question where you were sort of asking yourself is, all right, well, great, you know, does this really all work? And, and if so, how well? So fortunately, I do have, you know, some data, uh, you know, I do actually have real engineering effort uh, numbers, uh, you know, sort of buried in, in the back of my pocket, uh, but just, you know, given the nature of these things, I can't exactly share precisely those, but I will be able to make some generalized uh, or at least uh, relative comparisons between things that we ourselves have done. So in the first phase of craft, um, there was kind of two main uh, sort of so-called SOCs that we, we pushed out. Um, and just to be clear, there was a lot of generators that were written that were really used very heavily across both of those. Uh, so particularly all the sort of, you know, general purpose processing was done with the, you know, perhaps at this point, very well-known RISC-V generator, specifically the rocket chip. Uh, there was a bunch of DSP generators were built for various things like, you know, FFTs, FIR filters, um, you know, various other versions of, of FFTs. Um, you know, uh, decimation and so on and so forth. We then had a number of other accelerator generators that, that we built. Um, you know, so this is again to just, you know, run particular uh, signal processing that we want to do of, you know, individual types of applications. Um, and in this particular example on the analog mixed signal side, we really focused on the ADC generator and sort of a CERTES front end generator. Um, so this ADC, you can kind of see in the block diagram over here on the left. And this is sort of for sort of a, a generic, let's say, uh, either radio or, uh, you know, sort of radar type of front end, where essentially you have an ADC, you know, sort of right at the baseband, and then all the additional signal processing afterwards is, is done in the digital domain. And so, you know, for, for an academic design, these are both in TSMC 60 nanometer, by the way, I should say. You know, these are, these are reasonably sized SOCs, you know, nothing tremendous by, by industry standards by any means, but, you know, 10.3 million gates and 4.2 million gates, 
you know, on a team, you know, roughly the size of, of what you can feed with a, you know, a couple of pizzas, you know, that's actually a pretty uh, sort of interesting demonstration. Now, one of the other things we did here was we actually ported that signal analysis SOC to GF14 nanometer. Um, and again, one of the key goals here is to show that, you know, we really could be process technology agnostic. And, you know, from our data, we were able to do that with about 5x less effort than the original design we had done, you know, for in the first place. Uh, so, you know, since this is a, hopefully a so-called silicon slash hardware crowd, um, you know, you're hopefully also asking yourself, oh, okay, well, that's fine. You built a bunch of chips, you know, did they really work? Um, and the short answer is yes, indeed, the silicon worked. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive set. This is just showing you kind of a couple of examples of, you know, characterizations that were done on different aspects of the silicon. So in this case, the ADC and the CERTES front end. Uh, these are sort of particular papers that were published on those. Uh, you can see some pictures from the lab just to give us, you know, a little bit more uh, credibility that indeed this is, this is all real. Uh, you can see some additional papers that, you know, we're talking kind of more of the SOC level aspects that I've highlighted at the bottom. But the bottom line is yes, indeed, the silicon did actually work. And so this is to say that, you know, we were basically able to track the same sort of degree of quality of results as we were expecting from kind of the way we had done the design in the first place. Um, so one of the sort of interesting things here is, you know, so I've told you what it was we built, but, you know, since that's kind of a baseline, it's hard to, to kind of see if that's really effective or not. Um, so what we went to try and just sort of compare ourselves and, and see if this was really a good way of doing things, um, at least in this first phase, we went to sort of one of these commercial effort estimator tools. Um, that particular tool at the time had not been updated to go sort of beyond 28 nanometer from a process technology standpoint. Um, but interestingly enough, sort of the actual effort that we had spent was about two to two and a half times lower than what the effort estimator kind of came up with for a 28 nanometer design. Um, and as you can imagine, 16 nanometer, just again, because of the complexity of the design rules tends to be a lot more difficult and therefore, you know, more effort uh, to actually build. And so we were, we were quite happy with these results, especially because this was really kind of our, our first shot out of the gate well, there's a lot of things that we're doing new all at once. Um, and so as I'm, you know, I'm hinting at here, there's a lot of time and effort spent on, you know, technology setup, you know, methodology and flow development and so on and so forth. So again, we thought this was actually a very promising result because, you know, again, this is like the first time out where with a generator, what you'd actually expect is that most of the savings would be, you know, later iterations when you're then really reusing that generator more substantially. So on that front, uh, there was a number of chips that we built also in phase two of that program. Um, I'd say probably the highlight of that one is, is the so-called 24, uh, this, this multiprocessor SOC that we called Eagle. Uh, so that one was around 24.6 million gates. Um, again, you know, for sort of a, this one's like a single pizza box uh, size team. Uh, you know, that, that was actually, I believe, a fairly impressive accomplishment. Uh, you know, had sort of a number of 28 gigabit per second CERTES on it, integrated with, I believe, eight processor cores and four clusters with, you know, shared L2 cache. And, you know, so fairly realistic kind of example of an SOC at least on the processing side of things that one might want to build. Uh, but, you know, again, this was actually expanded beyond that. So there was like an AI accelerator that was built using this methodology. Uh, it was around two and a half uh, million gates or so. And there was actually a much more, let's say, analog RF-centric uh, test chip that was done, uh, which was really kind of focusing on massive MIMO, specifically the RF front ends, where, you know, we actually went in and reused that ADC generator, developed new DAC generators, you know, had some of these RF front end kind of things, uh, and where the CERTES were really kind of expanding upon the previous work that we'd done in the previous phase. So I bring all these things up because, you know, at least now, since we have a second version, we can kind of compare ourselves against the first and how we did from an engineering effort standpoint. So in particular, if we kind of take the, the largest SOCs we had done, so that Craft P1, which is, again, was around 10 million gates or so, versus this Eagle, on the net, we spent about 2x less engineering effort for around 2.5x more gates, around a 3x higher core clock frequency, and I'd say around 4x higher sort of analog mix signal complexity. Now, some of these numbers are really hard to compare because as you can imagine, you know, sort of uh, going and stamping down repeated instances of the same thing, uh, you know, is, is a really fast way of getting, you know, sort of very large complexity counts uh, with relatively low effort. Whereas if you have a lot of, you know, sort of individual disparate blocks, um, you know, that each one had to be, you know, somewhat more handcrafted, uh, but, you know, but then, you know, you really have a large number of those, then obviously those relative efforts are very different. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, just given sort of the degree of similarity and the number of generators we're able to reuse, uh, I think this does fairly sort of clearly show that there has been a substantial benefit in going back and reusing those generators we developed in phase one to be able to kind of push the ball forward in this phase two set of designs. Now, to be clear, there are actually some silicon results from, from all these chips as well. Uh, just for the sake of, of, let's say, time, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. 
Uh, but again, things are very much matching with essentially what we expected, uh, you know, from the initial design and the level of verification we did in terms of what we're seeing on the silicon results as well. So just as another te teaser, um, you know, this is kind of showing you if I, I kind of put all these things together and I really want to put together an overall SOC, this is just sort of showing you like the full end-to-end -end flow, at least from a very conceptual standpoint. Um, and the, the main point that I wanted to highlight here is that, you know, essentially all the stuff that's in green can now become automated. You know, meaning that, you know, once you have a generator, you really can start, you know, doing these differing instances very, very quickly and rapidly. And kind of the manual work that you're sort of left to be done, and, you know, there's a little bit of the vision, but we're actually pretty close to this at this point, is to just go in and say, hey, what are the specifications I actually even want in this particular instance in the first place? And so once you get to this point, you know, for sort of the level of complexity of SOCs that, you know, I was describing previously, you know, if based on our run times and kind of your know, previous experiences, once you get to this point, it really is about a week or so from changing, you know, the parameters to just essentially a completely brand new and verified SOC instance. Now, again, you know, this is for a certain degree of complexity. Obviously, the more the complexity is, the longer it will take you to actually, you know, sort of go and e execute the flow. But this is just to give you a little bit of a teaser as to, you know, how effective this really can be when you get to that end point. So to kind of close all this out, you know, the, 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 you know, another natural question is just, all right, well, so great, you know, there's a bunch of this academic work that was done. You know, are folks out in the industry really starting to do this uh, in the real world? So the, the first sort of thing I want to point to is just if you go and uh, take a look at a company called Sci-5, um, and this is just a sort of a snapshot from one of the talks that they gave, uh, you know, this is almost a couple of years ago now. Um, it turns out, you know, their, their kind of big push is essentially in the design services for RISC-V based SOCs. Um, and really their, their business is very strongly built upon essentially having, you know, a very powerful chisel based generator for RISC-V based SOCs that they, you know, essentially built off of the work that was initially done at Berkeley, but then very much, you know, pushed it very far forward and from a, an industrial and commercial standpoint. Um, and you can actually go, if you go to their website, in fact, I think they've even updated it since there. You know, they essentially have this web interface where you go in and say, hey, you know, here are the parameters I want from my core. Um, and you'll just sort of click a button here on the website. But, you know, back in the back end, there's basically an engineer that, you know, grabs your parameters, enters that into the chisel generator, and will send you back the generated, uh, essentially, either core or SOC, as the case may be. So just to go back to, you know, sort of another part, which, you know, at least uh, for me is a little bit closer to, to, let's say, my heart, so to speak. And, you know, we can ask about, well, what about those analog folks, which, you know, as we said, we're really kind of back in the Stone Age and using the Stone Age tools, so to speak. And again, I'm making fun of myself here mostly more than anyone else. Um, you know, I'd say that there, there are some folks that are kind of dipping their toes in the water a little bit now. Um, you know, and then there's kind of a couple different aspects to that. You know, so one is just, you know, I think the biggest change for most people is that, you know, realizing that, okay, hey, like, what is it that I really did? And then sort of structurally writing that down is just oftentimes a different approach than people are used to, even though really the core of the loop itself has not changed. It's just, you know, forced to more explicitly express it. Um, and so there's some degree of, of you know, sort of, uh, let's say, challenge with that. Um, and then, you know, uh, largely generationally speaking, you know, there, there are also just folks that, you know, are, are not very, uh, let's say, familiar with just coding in general. Um, and so I think that's the other sort of obvious challenge that's there. Um, but the good news is that I think both of those are actually very much barriers that can be overcome. And, you know, I'll, I'll say some more about that uh, if folks are interested. So, you know, as I said, you know, people I think are starting to dip their toes in the water a little bit on the analog signal front, um, but really to help try and drive that ball forward, that's why some of my students and I decided to kind of co-found this company called Blue Cheetah Analog Design, or BC Analog for short. Um, and the idea here is really that, you know, we, we kind of just grabbed the set of folks that, you know, really had the, the leadership in terms of developing the bag framework itself, as well as sort of how one writes these analog generators. Um, and the idea is that we really want to leverage that framework. The framework itself will always continue to be in the open source. We really want to leverage those frameworks to go and essentially uh, just start providing to people analog mixed signal solutions, just really at much lower barrier to entry than exists today. Um, and that's either because of, you know, our ability to move to process technologies, you know, to other process technologies more rapidly, or because of our ability to sort of have these generators customize things more specifically to an individual customer's individual needs. So hopefully the very last question that, you know, is in many of your folks' minds is, well, okay, so this, this all sounds really interesting. You know, I, I would really like to start reaping some of these benefits. You know, how, how, do I, how do I actually just start doing this? How do I get into this mode of really writing generators for myself too? And the good news is that, you know, one of the big things we did in that DARPA craft program was go and just develop these, these so-called boot camps um, that are all sort of totally open source and out there on the web. 
uh, that you can just go and essentially through a web interface kind of walk through these little snippets of code where we kind of ramp you up um, at least on the very most basic aspects of how one does things in Chisel, as well as some of the basic things that one can do in BAG in terms of writing these generators. Um, the other thing that, you know, I think is an increasingly interesting movement, uh, which is actually the topic of that SRC panel that Shafel was referring to in the very beginning of this talk, um, is that essentially I think these generators and particularly some of this process agnostic capabilities that we have are really an enabler to, to making us be able to put some of these things out in the open source and not be worried about violating various foundry, you know, sort of NDAs and things like this. So all the generators that, that we did at UC Berkeley uh, under that DARPA craft program are actually open sourced uh, and or available for government use. Um, you know, there's a fairly long list of them, so I'm not gonna even attempt to kind of list them out, but you know, a lot of the things are pretty much all the things on these slides are in one way or another uh, sort of available. So feel free to reach out to me if you're interested in finding out more about that. Uh, you can either ping me on my academic email, which is just elad.berkeley.edu, or my company email, which is just elad.bcanalog.com. So I think that's uh, actually what I had. Uh, thank you all very much for your attention. I know it's uh, now in the evening for, for most of the folks in Israel, um, and I'm happy to take any questions if there are. I suggested for questions, just push uh, the yes button, or one of the buttons that you have in order to raise your hand. And there is one question in the chat from Jacob. Elad, can you see it? Elad, I think you are muted again. Yeah, I guess it just uh, it automatically muted my uh, <laughs> my uh, my speaker or whatever. <laughs> okay, so do you see the question in the chat? Uh, no, not yet. I'm still getting my way over to the chat. Uh, just because where is this? But yeah, if you want to maybe maybe just read it out while I'm looking yeah, for it, and then, so, okay. uh, then we can handle the other ones. Yeah. So so Yakov asked about the schematic generation. If you mm -hmm. can comment about uh, how does the generator knows the size correctly of the transistors. And uh, is it something like a GM over ID methodology? How, how do you generate the parameters? Ah, okay. So it's a it's a good question. Um, and as a warning, uh, you're you're going to get an answer that many other people may get too. Uh, you know, so which will be a little bit of a joke. But then you know, I'll, I'll be more serious. Um, so the answer is the way it knows how to do is is you know is essentially whatever you told it to do in the first place when you wrote the code. <laughs> um, so to be a little bit more clear, um, you know, when you write the schematic generator, the schematic generator itself, by the way, um, typically is very simple. You know, that's really just saying, hey, tell me what the size is and I will go and produce a schematic that has that appropriate sizing or that sizing that you told me to have. Um, I think your question is more about the so-called design script, which is the one that translates these higher level things like gain, bandwidth, and so on and so forth into an actual sizing. And the way that design script, make, that design script would make decisions really is truly, you know, it will do only what you tell it to, no more, no less. Um, so whichever way it is that you figure out to write in code how you yourself are making those decisions, that's what the design script will do too. I hope, uh, I hope that was clear or made sense, and obviously I'm happy to answer further follow-up questions on it as well. Okay, uh, Michael Slavsenko. Uh, yes, thanks. Um, I have a question um, regarding uh, um, the effort that it takes to uh, develop infrastructure for a new uh, process. So you mentioned that um, the initial development of uh, generators took some time and then transitioning to a new process uh, was much faster, but I feel like you kind of skimmed over uh, how much time and effort it took to develop a uh, like the, the layout infrastructure for a new process and so on. There's a lot of things going on uh, behind the scenes there, I feel. Uh, you know, it's, it's a good question. So, um, so yeah, so to, to, be, to be somewhat more concrete, um, you know, so particularly on the analog mix signal side, um, you know, anytime you move to a new process technology, you do have to go and develop those new primitives. Now, 
in terms of the amount of effort to do that, um, uh, I'd say there's kind of two uh, somewhat large, uh, let's say, multiplying factors. Um, the first and perhaps the most important is just sort of how familiar you are with the framework and what the layout API is really doing and what it is that you know you need to, to go and actually sort of code up in there. Um, and the second is just you know sort of how 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 different is that process technology than anything else you've seen before? And there's sort of two aspects of that. So let me touch on the first one and then I'll jump to the second one. Um, so the first one in terms of just expertise of the API, um, you know, obviously, you know, my group and my students and, you know, now sort of the folks at Brigida, you know, since we sort of came up with it in the first place, we're sort of, you know, very familiar with how these things are, are intended to be working. Um, and so oftentimes, particularly for, for sort of my lead student who's developing these things, you know, it's typically like about a two-week-ish two effort for him to bring things up, um, at least in sort of, you know, reasonably similar, similar PDKs, uh, but even in the most advanced process technologies. Um, you know, so he, he had from sort of other work experiences things where he was doing, you know, sort of latest and greatest FinFET uh, processes, where he was essentially able to sort of, you know, go look at the DRM, figure out what it is that, you know, he really wants to do in terms of mapping things onto the bag framework, and within a couple of weeks, he was basically up and running. Um, that is actually incredibly impressive, at least to me and, you know, probably to you too. Um, and I should be clear that, you know, because we have this API, we're not trying to draw all possible layouts one could ever think of, right? We have this very specific structure of things that we're trying to, to capture and construct. And so that's why there's many things that can be simplified. Obviously, the routing grid plays a big role in that as well. Um, but also, I think just, you know, he has a lot of expertise, and so he can do these things very, very quickly. The second part of it um, is not necessarily so much driven by that you are muted again. Okay. Okay, I should be back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it's just you know because uh, my phone is is not the co-host that you know when it when it mutes the participants, then my phone gets muted. Um, where, where did I get cut off? <laughs> oh, can you guys hear me? Uh, yeah, I was muted. <laughs> I think the last two <laughs> sentences were missing. Okay, got it. Um, yeah, so, so basically, um, just to sort of quickly recap, um, you know, for, for folks that have expertise in the framework, as I said, you know, two weeks-ish is kind of a, a typical number that I've seen, you know, and whether that's two weeks to a month, you know, varies a bit on the PDK. Um, but in terms of, let's say, the other aspects of things where, where you potentially end up spending some time when you do these, these porting activities, um, is, you know, it is possible that somebody comes up with, you know, a completely new way of doing transistors with a completely new set of rules and things like that. And then obviously you have to go back and re-examine the API and, you know, sort of add all those pieces in. Um, but I'd say that the much more common occurrence is not so much in the primitives themselves, um, but rather that what will happen is that, you know, when you, when you originally wrote your layout generator, you had an implicit floor plan in mind. Um, and you made some sort of assumptions about, for example, hey, I can fit this number of, you know, say vertical metal pitches in sort of, you know, this number of transistors. Um, and it just turns out that now when you move processes that that's no longer true. And so then when you try and rerun things, you know, obviously it breaks because, you know, now you have too much width or too little width or so on and so forth. Um, and so I'd say that the larger sort of category of things that, that tends to take a little bit more time is when just the concept of floor plan you had needs to be augmented or, or modified or even changed completely because of these implicit assumptions you made in the first place. So long answer to a, to a good question, but I, I, hope, uh, I hope that gave you some more uh, color on it. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, hello. Uh, yes, I'm wondering, uh, did you have any, any experience with uh, migrating uh, of uh, technology? No, be, 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 because uh, not, so, not, not so long ago I worked as a physical designer and one of the the notions, the, the ideas that, uh, that we, we don't need uh, automation or uh, generators like that, is that, that uh, when, you, when, you go, when you go to a new technology, so uh, the, the difference 
so so big that you you can do things like that. Yeah, it's it's a good question, and you know, I don't think there's a global answer because you know, as soon as I say, oh no no, like you know, everything we've ever done has always worked. You know, somebody will come up with you know some very bizarre transistor that behaves in a totally different way, and you know, at least from a layout standpoint, and then there'll be a lot of work to re-engineer things. So you know, I, I think I think the the meta idea here is really that you know what you're really trying to capture is what you know how to do, and 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 essentially you want to make it so that for all the stuff you really know how to do you should not be repeating that manually, right? Like that's the stuff that you should really be re-executing in a generator. And if indeed something new happens that you never thought of before and you don't know how to handle, then that's where you as a human should be spending your time, right? And to be clear, you know, once you spent your time to figure out, okay, well, how do I handle this new thing? That's what you want to then go back and add into the generator so that all future things that look similar to that or that have, you know, this characteristic that you've now figured out how to deal with, the code would now be able to deal with too. So... I would say that in practice, um, I think these things kind of go in generations, so to speak. So for example, you know, once you're in sort of the multi-pattern FinFET kind of thing, um, you know, in our experience so far, actually moving from one process to the next, you know, again, as long as you're multi-pattern slash FinFET, tends to be reasonably similar. Um, simply because I think, you know, kind of the, the physics and the chemistry of the manufacturing kind of drive everyone in very similar directions. And yes, you know, details of pitches and devices and things like that are a little bit different, but the general strategies tend to be very similar. Um, and in fact, at least for, let's say, uh, logic targeted technologies, even going back from FinFET to bulk also usually is relatively easy to do. Um, sometimes you'll pay a bit of an area penalty there just because, you know, you're sort of more gridded and more rigid than you need to be for the bulk things, but, you know, you did that for the FinFETs anyway, so it's, you know, sort of, you know, it's sort of okay in that you can actually get a design out, even if it's not the optimal thing in that bulk process. Um, but then, you know, again, if, if somebody comes up with, you know, whatever it is, and just to make fun of myself, you know, a mechanical transistor, you know, the layout has this like totally different thing and you, know, you can't even grid it anymore and so on and so forth, then yeah, you know, you're gonna have to go back and re-examine your strategies. Um, but so far, at least, you know, within the sort of FinFET multi-pattern generations, you know, I, I think there, actually, there is actually quite a bit of similarity and we've actually had good success, uh, you know, sort of doing that exercise. Okay, thank you. Of course. Okay, Tachi. Uh, Elad, you mentioned time savings, or effort savings. Do you have a rough estimate of uh, how much you pay in the quality of the result compared with an expert because of the restrictions on structure that you made in order to make it more uh, you know, simple enough for the automated stuff to work? Yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, I always like getting this question. Um, so th there's, so to be complete, uh, you know, your, your mileage will vary because obviously depending on how good of a designer you are, as well as how good you are at capturing what it is that you do, you know, the results will very, very much vary. But I'll, I'll at least give you some anecdotal evidence of, of sort of things that we have done in the past. Um, so, you know, we, we obviously anticipated this question, um, you know, a while ago. And so one of the first experiments we actually did was, uh, you know, so I had a student that was working on essentially a 60 plus gigabit per second uh, serial link. Uh, this was actually done in a 65 nanometer process. Um, so I mentioned all this just to say this was really pushing the bleeding edge of performance. Um, and, you know, and it was ISC paper, JSC, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we never told anybody, but we actually used the generator to build that thing. Um, and interestingly enough, well, I should be careful. We actually did two versions of it. One was we sort of did the fully handcrafted one that, you know, was published and et cetera. Then we did the other one that actually, you know, used the same design methodologies, but captured a generator and, you know, also built some other things around it. Um, and what was really interesting was that the one we did with the generator actually turned out to be a little bit better um, from a sort of power, you know, essentially at the same performance, it was like three or 4%, you know, lower in power. Um, and the main reason for that was just that, Essentially, when you do these things by hand, particularly through the long layout loop, um, there's a lot of things that you do which, you know, you know to be suboptimal, like, okay, hey, I have this long chain of latches in this equalizer. I'm just going to size them all to be the same, even though in reality they could actually be slightly different because, hey, it's only a few percent different and it'll be way faster for me to just do it that way. Whereas if I actually have a generator, you know, I can size things individually and, you know, the generator doesn't care, right? It can optimize everything. It's just computer time. Um, so in that particular case, it did actually turn out to be a little bit better. Um, 
and again, I think it just has to do with this thing of, you know, things that are super tedious to do by hand, you know, code doesn't care about tedium, it's just going to run, <laughs> right? Um, having said that, I wouldn't claim this is going to be universally true, right? There's always going to be some weird specific thing that people will want to do that, you know, at least in the most basic version of the API wouldn't exist. And we certainly run into that. Um, and the answer there is that, you know, there's, you don't have to be sort of religious about these things in the sense of, you know, you can always go back and sort of add in things that can essentially interface with these more customized cells. And in fact, there's an entire kind of layout style or layout engine, I should say, it was called Lego that, that followed that approach. Um, where you could say, okay, hey, there's this thing that like, I really don't know how to do this generically, but I know exactly how to do it in this process. So I'll go and I'll build this thing up as a kind of custom cell, but then all the stuff around it, I wanna be able to encapsulate in the rest of the framework. And so that's kind of the, the strategy that I would suggest there. Um, but to loop all the way back, yeah, I mean, in general, actually, our, our performance results have been sort of very comparable with what we ourselves were doing by hand. But it's definitely, a, you know, your, your, your mileage will vary kind of thing. Okay, thanks. Of course. Okay. And there's a question in the chat from Evgeny about uh, RF and millimeter wave parts. What about yep. uh, generating uh, digital controlled oscillators or time to digital converter? Yeah, um, so the, the, the studies that I had briefly mentioned that was in on that Eagle chip, um, that one actually had sort of a 14 gig DCO in it. Um, it's actually both a D slash VCO because it has both digital and analog controls in it. Um, it's, I guess it was a little bit hard to see from the picture being obviously it has inductors in it. It's got a resonant buffer and things like that. Um, so that's a good example of sort of a, an EM driven type of design uh, where there was actually, you know, sort of the additional EM simulation tools that were integrated in as well. Um, that's probably the farthest along, well, so yeah, I mean, so that's one example of sort of, you know, inductor based design type of thing. Uh, we have done some sort of power amplifiers at lower frequencies that, you know, again, use this generator based framework. Um, and I actually have a student right now who's working on building a bunch of generators specifically in the millimeter wave domain. Um, and, and I'd say that, you know, overall that's gone, I think, reasonably well. Um, and it, it really, I think with all of these kind of the, the key thing, you know, very much harks back to, to the same initial point, which is, you know, as long as you can kind of express for yourself in a structural way how it is that you go about doing these things, um, then, you know, then typically we can find a way to, to make the code work to do sort of the same thing. The bigger challenge tends to be, you know, okay, well, even if I built a design by hand before, you know, and, and we all do this, right? Me too, right? Like there's some things that you just sort of do by, by intuition or guess or, you know, sort of random walk. Um, and those are the ones where you sort of end up having to spend some more time on saying, okay, well, what did I really do, right? Well, how is it that I really got to this point so that I can then reflect that in the code and then make, you know, sort of more robust and repeatable decisions. Um, whereas, and again, by hand, it's sometimes faster to say, well, okay, I know approximately this thing sort of, you know, behaves maybe this way and I'll maybe just tweak it a couple of times. And then you just have to sort of answer for yourself, okay, well, like, what was I basing that tweaking off of that, you know, sort of drove me in that direction? And that's where you sort of write the code to, to do the same thing. So I, I do indeed believe that all of those are very possible. Um, and, you know, again, we have some preliminary results in that direction. Um, it's really just all about sort of how well we ourselves as the designers know how to build those things so that we can then write that as a piece of code. And next, Claudio. Yeah, uh, you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. So my question is, uh, okay, let's say when the generator is going to do something like look at the scam and say, hey, add the, add, add the casco here because you are lucky the casco structure, so not, not just resizing, but doing a different, different, different architecture. Because actually yeah. the, the actual analog is, is, is re-architecturing all the time, it's not only resizing or... Yep. No, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, the short answer is yes. Um, and, and as, as I guess I warned, um, you know, the, the, the longer answer is, you know, whatever you yourself know how to do, you can make the code do too. Um, so basically the, the key there would be, hey, if, if I know what, what set of, you know, what set of constraints or, or parameters it is that drives you to change the architecture, and I can programmatically capture that, then I can also make the code do the same thing. Um, and there's a number of different ways you can imagine to do it. So let's take, you know, let's take like a PLL as an example. Um, you know, one could imagine a hierarchical PLL generator where you come in with a set of specifications, you know, say like phase noise and things of this nature. Um, and then you could do some preliminary characterization and look at it and say, okay, well, hey, uh, 
if I really want, you know, this level of phase noise, I actually am forced to go to an LC, and then at that point, you would invoke the LC oscillator sort of generator and the LC, you know, the LC-based PLL generator, whereas, okay, hey, maybe if I'm in this other regime and I really care about area, then I would go and switch to a ring oscillator-based uh, design. Um, so, yeah, so those things absolutely can be done. Um, I guess, as I hinted at a little bit already, the, the just practical way you tend to do it um, usually is by sort of partitioning out the sub-generators of different architectures and then above it deciding which one to actually make use of. Um, and the one above sometimes will just, you know, try and call one and see it doesn't work and, you know, switch to another or, you know, or other strategies are, are equally uh, possible. But yeah, that, that that's definitely possible. Um, and again, it's just, let's say it's the, the, the world is your oyster in that, you know, as long as you as a designer can kind of structurally describe how it is that you can do it, then, you know, you'll write the code and, and it'll do the same thing. Yeah, so my question is, okay, and let's say you have a flow that can do that. Is it going to put some AI on it? Because uh, we have seen some <laughs> examples of AI doing an amplifier that they were interested, but, but I, my, the impression is that if you are not really using AI here, I, you are not going to get to a spider. The, you know, another design is a spider of uh, hundreds of parameters going in different directions and and then someone is going to change a, a single capacitor and uh, I, I will go 40 years ago my, to my old analog teacher saying me, okay, if you move a single wire, you are in a new problem. Yep. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's a great question. And, you know, I have, I have debates with my colleagues. My, my personal opinion, well, I'll start with a more controversial thing and then, and I'll, and then I'll be slightly more practical. Uh, my personal opinion is that, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think the AI will really buy you all that much. <laughs> um, certainly not in the most generic sense of you just try and throw something that really knows absolutely nothing about analog and, you know, have it try and pick these things off. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's much hope in that for, for many of the same reasons that you just described. Um, by the way, were you guys able to hear me in the beginning or was I muted? I just saw a notification. <laughs> oh, we, we had you. Okay, good. Just making sure. Yeah, so my, my personal opinion is that, yeah, I think the, the most brute force version of it, uh, I think, is just a little bit silly. Um, now, to be slightly more practical, um, well, I should take another step back. So I, I think the main issue with, with these AI kind of things is actually the one that's shared with, you know, just generic analog place and route, which is I don't think it's impossible to, to teach either one of those engines how to do things. I think that it just requires such a large space of constraints that by the time you're done specifying the constraints, your, your A probably would have been done with what you really wanted to do way, way faster, um, and B, you're super frustrated because you spent all this time telling the tool not to do incredibly stupid things, right? Um, and so that's actually kind of why we took the approach we did with BAG, which was we said, hey, look, you know, with analog, there's all these unmodeled effects, there's all this sort of inherent knowledge, and, and really, if you kind of look at it, particularly in the advanced process technologies, the space of things that you, you, know, you actually should do, which are quote unquote correct, is way, way smaller than the space of things you should not do. And so it just makes a lot more sense to have people constructively specify what they actually want to have happen, rather than try and teach a general purpose thing how to all, not make all the really stupid mistakes that you don't want it to make. So yeah, so that's, that, that's kind of my general opinion. Um, I think there are some caveats to that that I, that I do believe are interesting. Um, so one is the, you know, for example, as we've been talking a lot about, you know, I think there are things that we kind of as designers, as humans do that we don't necessarily kind of, we don't have a good way of, let's say, structurally and formally describing as a piece of code. Um, and I think that's particularly true for things that have sort of weaker trade-offs that are harder for us to kind of come up with a good analytical or intuitive model for. Um, and so I think, if you sort of constrain some machine learning algorithm to really sort of answer those more specific questions, you know, so that again, you don't have this enormous parameter space and kind of, you know, unknown and weird, stupid things that could happen. Uh, I think that's a much more likely path for success. Um, and then the other one, which I will admit, you know, I think is, is academically at least interesting and, you know, we'll see if it goes anywhere. Um, you know, one of the side interesting things is that, you know, if I really do have these generators, I can actually start to produce a lot of different instances um, and as you probably know very well, you know, for, for machine learning, you know, one of the most powerful ways to be successful is to just get a whole, you know, crap ton of data. <laughs> um, and so I do think there's a potential, you know, way you could do this, which is, you know, you go and you write the thing you really know how to do kind of, you know, from your, from your, from your design experience, from your intuition and everything as a generator, 
spray out a whole bunch of instances and then see what happens with the you know with the AI that, that interacts with it. Um, the, the last thing I'll mention is that you know there are some efforts from some of my colleagues at Berkeley where you know for example the layout problem they're not trying to solve they just write you know sort of bag generators the same way that we do now uh, but they're trying to teach some of these you know some of these more AI algorithms or machine learning types of things to, to sort of you know do the design space exploration uh, you know try and do that based on these sort of limited number of simulations to just you know accelerate runtime. I mean, you know, again, I think those are those are pretty interesting, especially if you really couple that with, you know, sort of specifically going after pieces of things that the designers can't express as well, right? Because um, that's where I think there's sort of the most bang for the buck in terms of, hey, there's a thing that I don't exactly know how I wanted to do it, but I can kind of give you a general direction and then have the AI go and figure out you know, sort of, you know, really, okay, yeah, is it L of exactly, you know, 90 nanometers or 90.3 or so on and so forth. So great question, long answer, but I, I hope uh, I hope it gave you a flavor of things. Great, hey, Idan. Hi. Um, so what I was wondering, it seems like a lot of what you're trying to do is um, working between like streamlining things, but also making things. Um, or giving you more versatile options, making things a little bit more modular for you to be able to do a lot of different things using the same base. And it mm -hmm. kind of goes to what Claudio said about AI, but I was wondering if not, you know, if you don't think that AI can um, work in that way, have you tried implementing, because it seems like this is one person right, sitting down, writing his philosophy of design into a generator, and I was wondering if there was anything where, like, you know, a team had different or like try to code a generator that had different philosophies that you could choose from as you were going. Like choose what, you know, trade-offs you wanted to do and being given options along the way. Yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. Um, we haven't exactly done precisely what you described. Well, uh, yes and no. Um, so I think there's, there's kind of two really interesting pieces to what you're asking about. Um, and one of them is, is kind of a little bit of a twist on what you said, and then the other I'll, I'll sort of address directly. Um, so the twist on it is, you know, th there's many different ways that one can attempt to sort of accelerate, you know, in absolute time, you know, in execution. Um, and, and obviously one of the best ways to do that is to be able to do things in parallel. And, and so one of the things that I think is quite interesting with generators is it does allow you to parallelize things, I think much more naturally than sort of the typical design flow would sort of lead you to believe is the case. Because for example, if I already have a general floor plan strategy in mind, I can go and actually start writing the layout generator long before I have any idea how to actually really size the thing. Um, and similarly, I can go and actually, you know, sort of build up the schematic generator, build up all the behavioral models, start building some of the design, you know, algorithm infrastructure, you know, sort of somewhat in parallel with all these other things, you know, really going on at the same time. And perhaps most importantly, I can build all the verification infrastructure. Um, and as you were hinting at, I'm probably going to try and do that in a way that's somewhat uh, generalized and modular so that, you know, let's say I have a particular way of building, say, a VCO, you know, many of the tests that you do don't depend on the details of the VCO, right? They just, you know, I want to characterize phase noise, I want to characterize, you know, sort of maximum minimum oscillating frequencies, I want to characterize tuning ranges, and so on and so forth. You know, these are all things that, you know, once I, have, I build one uh, powerful enough, you know, sort of infrastructure, I can really apply to many, many different design instances. Um, so I think there is a, a, you know, really interesting opportunity for, for just kind of more parallelization than otherwise is possible, um, which again is kind of the, the related thing to your question. Um, in terms of the specifics of your question, um, yeah, so like, there are definitely cases where, you know, there, there are things inside of it that sort of say, okay, hey, like, you know, if you run into this case, you know, try it this way. And if you run into that case, try it this other way. Um, this happens, this tends to actually happen a lot in the layout for kind of reasons I hinted at previously of, you know, are you device pitch limited or wire pitch limited or so on and so forth. Um, at least, you know, sort of so far we, we've, when we have actually multiple experts, we've tried to kind of get everybody into a room and, and sort of bang it out and kind of, you know, figure out why person X did, you know, thing A and person Y, y did thing B and, you know, and try and reconcile them, um, you know, to try and sort of make the, the one generator kind of be as good as, as we think everybody should make it. Um, but in principle, you know, you, you could write the code the way that you described too, uh, you know, just depends on obviously the exact application. And, and actually that's, that's also, you know, let's say one, one hidden motive that I kind of have in all of this is that, you know, I hope if all these things are successful enough, particularly on the academic side, people will just start putting these generators out in the open source 
And then people really can go and evaluate it very specifically. Okay, hey, like, you know, person X did this thing and, you know, that got them this results and person Y did this other thing and got them a very similar result. You know, let's actually go through and see where the decisions were made and, you know, see how if we tweak things, you know, what, what will really change. Um, so, yeah, it, it very, I, I think there's a lot of interesting opportunities there. I guess is maybe way I'd summarize it. Thank you. Of course. Do, do we have other questions? Okay. I think not. Uh, so we'll add. Uh, I think one. Yeah. Uh, Elad, I want to take you back to your first uh, couple of slides. You don't need to go there. You made two sure. backgrounds. One was that presently the IP market is a black box. If it fits good, if not, not. How do yep. you see the new modularity? Do I buy a tweakable IP and adapt it? Or do I go finer grain and get a layout generator from source one? and something else generator from two and put it together to make my uh, service or whatever. And the other yep. question related to another statement you made, you said that today the, the cost of an SOC is roughly, I think you said 300 million bucks. Right, that's so quoted from IPS. I yes. this whole thing <laughs> and it works and everything is fine, what would the number come down to? Optimistic. Yep. Yeah, no, no, th those are both great questions. Um, so let me start with, um, yeah, let me start with the second one. So um, I, I think the, the, the answer there obviously is going to heavily depend on, on what exactly is sort of the business that you're in. Um, so where this is going to be most efficient is where you have something that A, has a lot of variance, meaning that you know, there's a family or class of things you're trying to do, and there's different sort of types of SOCs you want to build for that class of things, where each one may, you know, sort of somewhat look very different, but the approach that you take to build each of them is very, very similar. Um, you know, so it's kind of like take the stupidest example of it, you know, like something where like, oh, in some application spaces, you have a single core, and in others, you have you know, many, many cores. Again, that's a really dumb example, but it's just to give you the flavor. You know, I, I think in those cases, you know, you can easily be looking at, you know, 10 to even perhaps... 30x kind of numbers um and again that just very much depends on you know how many variants you have you know exactly what you're doing but you know in practice that that does seem to be a, a very achievable thing to do i um, mean in fact i think there are companies that even if not with the exact methodologies that we have you know follow similar approaches and, and that's sort of a good degree of their success in you know, sort of covering a product space um i think the the other sort of you know sort of natural class of things that potentially can win a lot from this is that you know, you, you kind of, this is where really sort of the porting side of things would, would make a lot of sense. Um, um, where, where again, like from whatever reason you need to move from process technology X to process technology Y. Um, and, you know, you need to do that sort of without necessarily changing a whole lot about, you know, the architecture of the thing, but, you know, just really want, you know, to sort of cover that space of things. Um, this is becoming more and more relevant in some of these government applications. Um, and, that, and that's, again, where I think, you know, there's the potential for very big wins there. You know, again, in that, you know, 10 plus X kind of range, uh, simply because of, again, you know, you're really then focusing just on the very specifics of that process and not necessarily re-architecting all these other things that, you know, are now actually captured by the generator. Um, and so now I guess, I, I'm sorry, I forgot your first question. you remind me of the, uh, the first question again? Yeah, the, the new type of uh, modularity. Would it be just buying ah. the that I can adapt? Yes. Or maybe okay. yes, finer yes, grain yes. modularity? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, to be honest, I don't think I know the answer yet. And in fact, that's kind of one of the questions we're asking ourselves at the, at the company as well. Um, so, and, and, you know, I, I think I can see this working out a number of different ways. Um, I think at least from what we've thought of so far, um, I, I believe that, you know, a, a lot of this depends on who the customer is, right? So there are definitely going to be customers that, that are going to come in and basically say, hey, look, you know, I really want this particular certes that, you know, is maybe compliant to XYZ standard, but I also want this, you know, special little mini feature that's just for me that, you know, that is not really in the standard, but like, you know, but hey, can you just slide that in? Um, and so I think to the extent that the generator, you know, sort of has capability to do that, I think the the sort of model that starts to make sense, which to be clear is actually very much bar borrowed from what Sci-Five is doing, is you basically say, okay, hey, you know, pay us a subscription for the generator, 
uh, you know, here are sort of the suite of things that you can play around with. Um, and then basically, you know, have the customer sort of drive what it is that they really want. And essentially, uh, it's probably going to be the case that, you know, sort of the people who are experts in the code are always going to be the one really running the code. Um, but, you know, at least in terms of presenting an interface that people can see what it is that they can play with, you know, that's what I think would be the, the natural way to partition that. Um, but that's, again, kind of, that's closer to, I think, the traditional IP model. Um, it's also certainly possible that, you know, as you're hinting at, someone may just say, okay, hey, look, like, you've got a really good layout generator for this DCO, and I, you know, and that was costing me a lot of my time and effort in my previous, you know, 30s or whatever it was, so I'm going to go and buy that thing from you, but I'm going to, you know, sort of build everything else around it, either from other vendors or from my own way or so on and so forth. Um, so, yeah, so I think, I think both of those are, are, are certainly possible, and, you know, I, we're, we're kind of doing the experiment live to, to see which way it'll go. And, you know, the answer may be both, or maybe, you know, one of them just turns out to win for, for you know, sort of market reasons. Yeah, and, and which way that goes, uh, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> and what's your message to a student considering getting into VLSI design or analog? Is more than we ah. need it or fewer or only the best or what's the... No, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. I think my answer, my answer, and, you know, I've sort of gotten other versions of this question, um, which are sort of like, oh, hey, like, you know, what about machine learning? Is my job going to go and all these other kinds of things? I think the answer is really, you know, if you really know what you're doing and you really have deep expertise and knowledge, there will always be lots and lots of jobs for you. Um, so the message I usually give people is, hey, look, you know, if this is the thing that, you know, you know you're interested in, you're not excited in, um, you know, you go, you get that knowledge and expertise, you will be very, very well employed. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and that's, since I now have sort of both hats, you know, I, I can see it from sort of both sides of, you know, we're, we're constantly looking for people that you know, really have that expertise. And, you know, from all my friends at larger companies, you know, that, that's remained true, you know, to this day, uh, you know, despite Corona get it and everything. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I tell people is, you know, like getting expertise, getting the depth, you know, of knowledge that will never go away because, even in the most sort of aggressive forms of, of AI that, you know, where they've had the largest degrees of success so far, there's always what they call the quote unquote domain expert that's driving stuff. So, you know, getting that expertise, uh, I think, you know, is, 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 a, is a very stable bet. <laughs> okay. And, and I have a follow-up question, but so it's not only about job security, right? So do you think that the skills for an analog designer will be different? Like they will be, they will need to be programmers and not, they won't touch every two hours anymore? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I, you know, I don't think Virtuoso is ever going to go away. And I don't say that only because, you know, I collaborate with Cadence. Um, you know, I think debug is always critical. And, and you know, you always want to debug in the, in the thing that people are most familiar with. Um, I, I do think that, you know, sort of familiarity with programming and perhaps equally importantly is just sort of comfort with programming and thinking of things that way, I think indeed will be very important. Um, and I guess, you know, Shaka and others, you can probably, uh, you know, you can probably back me up on this, but at least in my experience, uh, you know, for sort of the, the, the newer generations of students, um, you know, I'd count this up to, you know, 10 plus years ago even, you know, being comfortable with software and code is, is kind of a non-issue for most of the students that I see. Um, and I'd say, you know, by most, I mean like probably 90 plus percent. Um, in fact, as I, as I assume you guys also see, you know, the battle is usually the other way around of, mm -hmm. hey, no, look, there's this hardware stuff. Like, you know, you should really think about that too. It's actually pretty cool. <laughs> um, and you can even leverage some of your software skills. Um, so yeah, so I think that there's definitely kind of a, a generational thing there of, you know, for, for a lot of the sort of, you know, younger folks, you know, being able to do things in code really is, is not very much of a barrier. Um, however, of course, typically speaking, you know, many of the current experts, you know, don't necessarily fall in, in that particular category of things. Um, and so there's another sort of interesting set of experiments that, you know, so far have actually worked out reasonably well of, you know, can you basically couple these younger people that, you know, have good domain knowledge, but are not necessarily the expert yet, but, but are comfortable with coding. Can you compare those folks up with, you know, you know, the real experts in a particular, you know, circuit or block or whatever it is, and can you do something sort of really productive with that? Um, and as I said, that's, you know, a little bit of experiment in progress, but, but so far preliminary data seems to say that, yeah, that can actually work out pretty well. Because uh, it sort of both helps the domain expert, you know, sort of say, okay, yeah, here's really what I was actually doing, as well as then obviously trains up, you know, sort of the, the younger person to, to kind of figure out, okay, hey, like, yeah, this is why this is important. And, you know, for them, putting into the code usually is, is quite straightforward. Great. Okay. Do, do we have other questions? I think not. So, Elad, I want to thank you again for your time and for the great talk. And Thank you. We hope, we hope that to see you uh, soon after the, all the coronavirus stuff.
Right, exactly. Yes, yeah. uh, I hope to hope to visit you guys sometime soon too. <laughs> yeah. You're safer anyhow. Right. Well, uh, particularly these days. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye.